Imagine if you woke up and one day your hand just had a life of its own. And you're on the subway and your hand starts groping other people or what. You'd be really, really enraged at your hand because it's just not obeying your will. That's how narcissistic people feel about other people who disappoint them or thwart them. Welcome to Lovelink, your guide to love and sex in all forms. We're your hosts, Simone Humphrey and Sina Simon. Our guest today is a speaker, author, and family therapist who specializes in men's issues and couples therapy. He founded the Relational Life Institute, offering workshops for couples, individuals, and parents, along with professional trainings for clinicians to learn his effective model of treatment. His best-selling books are I Don't Want to Talk About It, Overcoming the Secret Legacy of Male Depression, and The New Rules of Marriage, What You Need to Make Love Work. Here to talk to us today about how male narcissism and patriarchy impact relationships is Terry Real. So welcome, Terry Real. Thanks so much for being here with us. Oh, it's a joy to be here with Thanks you Thanks for both. coming. So we want to start out with the word narcissism. I feel like that word gets thrown around all the time now. And there's Are such... Are you bringing that up because I'm here? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> So we'd love to know your definition of narcissism. You know, it's interesting. Well, I have two things to say about that. The first is I actually find speaking about shame and grandiosity as clearer for many people than speaking about narcissism. So I just had a, a lady come up to me in a workshop yesterday and tell me she's confused about whether her client was narcissistic or not. And I said, well, are they one up? Are they superior? Are they contemptuous of other people or of the rules? And she said, yeah. And I said, well, that's grandiosity, so why don't you just call it that? Um, having said that, there is uh, there are narcissistic traits. Um, I make a point, and I don't want to talk about it, really based on the Renaissance philosopher uh, Marcello Ficino, that the, if Narcissus, if you look at the myth, you know, he's glued to the well. He's glued to his image. And commonly we think of Narcissus as an emblem of too much self-love, but it's really too little. He's addicted not to himself, but to his image. And the essence of narcissism is the interplay of shame and grandiosity filtered through external supplies, narcissistic supplies. Um, You don't have an internal sense of well-being and self-love, and you supplement it. There are three forms of unhealthy self-esteem in our culture that our culture runs by, by the way. Performance-based esteem, which is I have worth because of what I can do. Um, I can land a big sale. I can give my wife an orgasm. I can uh, close the trunk of this car. And performance-based esteem, of course, is very big for men. And what a lot of women don't understand is that it's very fragile. The English common acknowledgement of this is the fragile male ego but it's really based on the idea that you're only as good as your last performance and there's always somebody younger smarter limberer you know uh, warming up in the wings men live in a one up one down world based on performance and it's very very volatile it's very fragile The second form of narcissistic or unhealthy self-esteem we call other-based esteem, uh, which is, I don't have self-worth, but I do if you think I do. Uh, I do if you have worth uh, heading in my direction. Uh, Workaholism is an extreme version of performance-based esteem. Love addiction is an extreme version of other-based esteem. And, of course, men tend to performance-based and women tend to other based, although there are lots of variations. The third is attribute based esteem, uh, which is I have worth because of what I have big muscles, a fancy car, a trophy wife. And uh, our culture runs on attribute based esteem. Buy this product and you'll be a person of distinction. I like to say if we all got into relational recovery tomorrow, our economy would collapse overnight. <laughs> but don't worry about it because it's not going to happen. 
So anything that's about an external supplement to an internal deficit of self-esteem you can call narcissism. Narcissistic people use other people for their own uh, purposes. We speak about them being narcissistic extensions. We talk about narcissistic rage. Narcissistic rage is, I explain it to the uh, men and women who are narcissistic this way. Um, imagine if you woke up and one day your hand just had a life of its own. And you're on the subway and your hand starts groping other people. or what? You'd be really, really enraged at your hand because it's just not obeying your will. That's how narcissistic people, people feel about other people who disappoint them or thwart them. So um, it's an interesting concept. By the way, since we're on it, this may be more answer than you had in mind, but I make a distinction between several different kinds of narcissists depending on their personality style. So there's a narcissist proper, which is you know, just the kind of person who uses people. But then there are two different styles of narcissists that I think it's useful to discover. One is an hysterical style. And I use that, I know that word has fallen into disrepute, but I use it in the old psychiatric uh, nomenclature. Hysterical meaning warm, charming, expressive, emotional, more quote-unquote feminine. Uh, Bill Clinton is a narcissist with an hysterical style, charming, charismatic. Then there's a narcissist with an obsessive compulsive style. They're the often guys who like, if you loved me, you would line the shoes up the way they're supposed to be lined up. These guys are tight asses and they're a real pain to be around. So it's really interesting to distinguish between these different styles of narcissists. Narcissist proper, narcissist with a charming hysterical style. They can be a lot of fun, but they're not very trustworthy. And narcissists with an obsessive compulsive style who tend to be very controlling and tight. And can you talk a little bit about how these styles emerge from childhood? Or, or even just more generally how narcissism emerges? Well, you know, I have a saying. Uh, we tend to hold ourselves the way we were held. So if you were held, that's why healthy self-esteem is such a rare commodity in our culture. Uh, because, as my pal Esther Perel puts it, the school of relationships, namely our family that we all uh, grow up in, are little cultural artifacts. You know, I talk about the impact of culture on our psyches. The impact of culture on our psyches comes largely through our families. Our families are cultural institutions and cultural transmitters. And if you think about something like the way boys are held under patriarchy, um, I, uh, I showed a film just yesterday in a workshop of a boy, a man now, an offender uh, in recovery, but a guy who used to masturbate in public. And um, he went back to being five years old, and his stepfather uh, took away his blanket, his security blanket, lined up the entire family, and had him burn it at five. Oh, so painful. This is not a man with healthy self-esteem. He, As he put it, I quickly learned to hate myself. So hating himself was just internalizing the relationship of hating that he'd grown up with. And um, so different people adapt in different ways. There's a long answer about the different ways that we adapt. Um, we adapt some through reacting to what's going on to us. We adapt some through modeling what's going on for us are what I call adaptive child part, usually uh, between 5 and, and 20 uh, and when we do imaginative work, that inner child part of you, what Dick Schwartz would call the uh, protectors or manager parts of you. Um, that adaptive child is almost always an amalgam of what you took in and how you reacted to what you took in. So, for example, if I have an intrusive mother... I may, I may have an adaption through reaction to that by putting up a big wall, right? I say, the, uh, show me the thumbprint and I'll tell you about the thumb. The thicker the wall, the bigger the intrusion. That's the reactive way of getting an a adaptation. Um, the modeling way is uh, my dad would react to my intrusive mother, his intrusive wife, by being behind, guess what, walls. And so... 
the adaptive part of me is reacting to the intrusion of my mother and modeling the distance of my father. And it's usually a combination of those two. It also makes me think about on a societal level what um, you know somebody like Trump is modeling for young men today. Can I tell you the good news about that? Tell us. <laughs> you know, I uh, gave a workshop on difficult men uh, three or four years ago at the Psychotherapy Networker, and it drew 50 people. I gave that same workshop last year. It drew 350 people. Wow. Mm. It's more and relevant. the difference is called Donald Trump. Mm-hmm. And I think that uh, we were asleep during the Obama years. We were complacent. We thought we really had it made. We thought feminism had won the day. And um, we're still in the struggle. So... You know, just yesterday as we speak, there were more people marching on Washington than there were during Trump's inauguration. So I think that the the lines are drawn. I think that gender progressives have our work cut out for us. And unlike five years ago, we know we have our work cut out for us. I, I've been talking about this stuff, as you well know, for 30 years. Ten years ago, if I said the word patriarchy, people would fall asleep. If I said the word feminism, people would walk out the door. Now, all of a sudden, it's hot again. People are paying attention. People need to pay attention, and they're realizing it. And I think it's also interesting that, you know, narcissism or grandiosity, as you describe it, really falls on a spectrum, that there's some people that seem more pathological about it, and it really impairs them. And then there's the more subtlety um, that everyone has, because we esteem ourselves through all these other pieces. Yeah. Well, you know, one of the things I say is that pathology is rarely an aberration of the norm. I mean, there are people who like to get dressed up in latex and, you know, hit each other with things. But it's more often an exaggeration of the norm. I wrote about Trump and masculinity. The, the, the issue is he's an exaggeration of the norm and uh, a caricature of the norm. And in some ways, um, one of the things I say in the piece is that Trump is in some ways conservative's ugly stepchild. Uh, In some ways, Trump is explicit about what many conservatives in America have been implicit about, the racism, uh, the the elitism, uh, the misogyny, which has always been there on the conservative agenda, uh, but was a little more subtle than it is now. And it's mixed with this incredible kind of buffoonery uh, that uh, is quite amazing. In some ways, it reassures me. To be honest, I'd rather deal with a clown-ish character, no offense to anybody, uh, like Trump, than deal with somebody who has the same agenda but is, frankly, more competent and effective. So you've been working with couples pre-Trump and the impact of patriarchy on couples, and now you work with couples post-Trump and the kind of more overt influence of patriarchy. So what what kind of differences, if any, have you noticed? Well, there are people, mostly women, um, who have a kind of Trump trauma. Um, There was a patient that I saw who had a uh, philandering, uh, boundaryless, aggressive, narcissistic father who no one called out her whole life, who was inappropriately, never quite frankly incestuous, but quite inappropriate with her sexually and exploitative. And um, she uh, went into a a major depression when Trump was elected. And I I remember leaning into her and saying, your father is now the president of the United States. So there are people who are very directly affected by this. There are people who are affected not in terrible ways, but in good ways by being motivated to, you know, not not to whatever, but there are kids your guys' age who really thought feminism was the thing of the past, that it, 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 it had done its job, and we were like post-feminist, and it's a wake-up call, and people are really mobilizing. One of the things gratifying for me is that the people who are perhaps most interested in my work on patriarchy are millennials. Young people are really fascinated by this work right now, and I think it's been a wake-up call. So I think it cuts both ways. When it comes to romantic relationships, when it comes to couples, there are ways in which narcissism 
can express itself in more explicit and more kind of subtle ways. And I'm yeah. curious if you could talk a little bit about how it can be expressed in these more subtle ways. Well, you know, one of the things I say is that our culture rewards adaptive children. Our culture it does not uh, reward functional adults. It's actually afraid of them. Under the rubric of patriarchy, which it's now clear we all live under still, uh, our world is split in half between the so-called masculine and the so-called feminine. And in that dichotomy, intimacy itself is seen as feminine. And we do to intimacy what we do to many things feminine. We idealize it in principle and we devalue it in fact. So it's a hallmark card of you know couples holding hands and skipping off. Uh, but we don't teach anybody any skills. Uh, I would like to see relational skills taught in elementary school and junior high and high school. Um, so that in some ways a narcissistic man or a grandiose man coupled with a uh, more shame-based codependent woman is the cultural norm. I like to say that a outwardly grandiose driven, inwardly shame-based man coupled with an outwardly compliant woman uh, who is inwardly resentful and shame-based, that's America's power couple. Mm. Mm. I, uh, I deal with a well-heeled crowd. People fly in to see me from all over the country. And um, that is the couple that I see over and over again. And this couple has been very successful in the world and made a hash of their personal life. And how do their problems manifest? What does that look like? Well, first of all, it, it, nine out of ten times, it's the woman who's carrying the dissatisfaction. Uh, one of the things to understand about grandiosity is that it doesn't feel bad. That's one of the open secrets. It feels good. Shame feels bad, and you're motivated to get out of it. But grandiosity feels good. Uh, psychiatrist George Valiant in Boston said there's two kinds of guys in the world. There's a guy who walks into an elevator, gets claustrophobic, and turns green. And there's a guy who walks into an elevator, lights up a big fat stogie, and everybody around him turns green. And that's the difference between shame and grandiosity. So grandiosity feels good. I, I deal with couples on the brink of divorce. That's my, that's my beat. You know, couples come in and see me. We spend a two-day intervention together. At the end of that time, you're either back on track or divorcing. So it's, it's the end of the line. What does it feel like to be on the other side of the grandiosity, so to be the partner? What have, what have you heard from women who are on you know, the receiving end of the grandiosity? You mentioned resentment. I'm curious if anything else comes up as well. Yeah, protection protection yeah the third ring of the three concentric rings of psychological patriarchy i call the core collusion and it's a very ugly fact but i think it's one of the great unnoticed psychological forces in the world and it is this whoever is on the feminine side of the equation has a profound impulse to protect the disowned fragility of whoever's on the masculine side of the equation even while being hurt by that person you know, the common English word for that is codependence. But it's really part of the traditional feminine role. It's what allows the relationship to survive. M women manage men. And men know they're being managed, which is part of the reason why men don't trust women. Uh, but women manage men. Look, one of the things I say is that leading men and women into intimacy is synonymous with leading them beyond patriarchy. The traditional gender roles of men and women aren't built for intimacy. They're built for stability. And uh, the traditional role for men uh, is to be invul an invulnerable performer. And the traditional role for women is to be a resentful manipulator. And uh, neither of those roles uh, breed much intimacy. But women... Uh, what, what happens with women is that they form a deeper empathic bond to the little boy inside the man than the man does. The man has disowned that little boy. And the woman thinks, ah, if I could just love up that little boy, then I could get to the heart and all would be well, even if they're being pummeled by the man's grandiosity as acting out or rage or 
uh, substance abuse or whatever. I, I like to say there are two cohorts uh, in the modern West who believe that if you're dealing with a grandiose, uh, troubling man, uh, if you love up the little boy inside the man, all will be well and the grandiosity will dissipate. Those two cohorts are uh, codependent women and therapists. <laughs> <laughs> we fall into that category. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Not all grandiosity is a defense against shame. Uh, some grandiosity just comes from straight false empowerment. So uh, false empowerment which is a form of abuse in childhood. Let me say something about that. Grandiosity can come from false empowerment, straight and simple. False empowerment is artificially pumping up a child's grandiosity or not checking it. So, for example, here's a sentence that uh, turns my blood cold. Ready? You understand me better than your father. Ooh. Mm. That's false empowerment. Yeah. yeah. And it yeah. leads to grandiosity. Disempowerment leads to shame. False empowerment leads to grandiosity. Neither are favors to the child. Because yeah. it's automatically putting the perspective of one up, one down, right? Like if right. you're better than your father, then your father's lesser than, which means you could be lesser than. That's right. It's, it's psychologically incestuous right. in that right. it, we are the couple, right. we are the elevated pair. Right. But more than that, it inducts the boy into the one up world, one up, one down world of masculinity. You know, people say that men fear intimacy. I don't think men fear intimacy. I think traditional men don't know what intimacy is. I think what men fear is being dominated, being subjugated. And in the one up, one down world of men, you're either the hammer or the anvil. There's no platform for actual connection. That is the great wage of patriarchy on men. It is disconnection. The way we turn boys into men in this culture, quote-unquote, is through disconnection. We disconnect them from their hearts, from their expression, from other people, from dependency. And one of the things I say is that the cost of disconnection in boyhood is disconnection as an adult. Right. And the gain is that they can reach immense amounts of success in other areas. We, we see, you know, like in, in corporate businesses or professionalism, there's a lot of value placed in unempathic ways of relating yes because you do work your way up the ranks that way so people do well in their uh public lives and uh do horribly in their private lives one of the things i say is that patriarchy is the water we swim in and we're the fish it's it's everywhere it's in us and around us and women and men both participate in it a lot of guys younger guys will fetch to me that uh, now that they're more sensitive, women don't find them so sexy. <laughs> I'm sure you've heard that one. Yeah. And, you know, I, there is some truth in that if they're just, they have no power at all. In, in sex therapy, we talk about polarity, and you have to have some polarity in order to have sexual attraction. Uh, and if these guys just turn into wimps, there isn't enough polarity. But... That's not what I'm after. And I want to make this really clear. It, it just really annoys the hell out of me when somebody says I'm trying to feminize men. I'm not trying to feminize men. I'm interested in whole human beings. I'm interested in human beings that can be strong and powerful in the setting where that's called for and sweet and tender in the setting where that's called for and have the wisdom to know which setting is which. That's what I'm interested in. So how do you help couples when they come to see you um, how do you help them to reconnect well there's a two-step process if there now there are role reversals where uh, the woman is on the masculine side of the equation she's grandiose and the man is casper milk toast there are plenty of those there are uh, couples where they're both blatants they're both uh, hogging the masculine side of the equation and they're both beating the crap out of each other there are some couples where they're both on the feminine side of the equation and they're nicey-nicey and it's pseudo-mutual, but they don't usually show up for therapy. You know, they're, they're okay on their own. Um, so there's lots of variations, but let's just say we do, we're dealing with the typical, this, I, this, I say like two out of three, three out of four, it's the man in the grandiose position. and the, I talk about blatants and latents the one who's egregiously anti-relational and the one who's more codependent enabling. When I've got that set up, 
The first move is to empower the latent. I, I have a saying generally, when a man's in trouble, my first move is to empower the woman. When the woman's in trouble, my first move is to empower the woman. So I want the woman to stand up to that grandiosity. They universally drop the guy off and want me to do that work for them. And I say, look, I'll go out on the limb with you, but not for you. He'll cut off the limb. I'll get fired. And when you're dealing with a grandiose person, we'll say man for now, you have to be able to answer the question that they're asking themselves, which is the following. Ready? Why should they put up with you? And the answer to that question I call leverage. Leverage means you have something in your back pocket that they want, a warmer, sexier wife, happier kids, a longer life, a healthier body, and you stand between them and negative consequences they don't want, like you're going to get left. So the first move is to empower the woman to stand up to the bullying or the irresponsible behavior of the man. I'll come in under her, but I won't get out ahead of her. And I'll do that empowering right in front of the guy. It sounds something like, for example, what happens if this doesn't get better? What do you have in your head? Do you have a time frame? Do you have an exit plan? And, of course, quite often they do. But a lot of times it's more subtle than that. It's just about the conviction of standing up for your rights. Um, one of the things I say to women, the first intervention with uh, these kind of codependent women, one-down women, is if you're unhappy, why don't you start acting like you're unhappy? A lot of women get into, I hate how you're treating me, what can I make you for dinner? <laughs> mm, yeah. And I want you to be congruent. I had a woman, a typical situation, she had a bullying husband who wouldn't come into therapy, of course. And so we did, this is a true story, we did a 90-second intervention for 10 days. And it sounded like this. She'd meet him at the door when he came home from work, and she said, I hate how you're treating me. I hate this, 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 and this. I've got an appointment with this guy, Terry Real, next Thursday at 7 p.m. I expect your butt in that chair. If it's not in that chair, I'll be even more unhappy and angry than I am now. And I'm plenty unhappy and angry now. What can I make you for dinner? <laughs> <laughs> Did he come in? <laughs> he absolutely came in. He was in that chair 10 days later. Yeah. 90 seconds. So it has to do with the woman's conviction. I talk about becoming a relational champion that you really get grounded in the commitment that uh, being in a nurturing, uh, essentially cherishing relationship is your birthright. And if you're not in an essentially cherishing relationship, it's not good for you, it's not good for the kids, it's not true, it's not good for the uncherishing person. So stand up for yourself. And I really appreciate that sentiment, I think especially coming from you as a male therapist, where you could just reinforce the patriarchy, silence the woman, and then stand up to her and just have one man listen to another man. Oh, you mean the usual? <laughs> exactly, exactly. The usual so way I, therapy runs. <laughs> the normal couple's <laughs> therapy with a guy. Uh. Yeah. Well, and, and you bring up a point that everybody always brings up, and I want this uh, clear for the women therapists listening. Women therapists can do this work. Most relational life therapists are women. Which is most therapists are women. And uh, if a woman can inhabit her own power and authority, uh, she can confront the man with loving skill in exactly the same way I do, and it'll be just fine. Don't disempower yourselves because you're a woman therapist. Are there ever times where you see couples and think, this isn't going to work? Yeah. This, yeah. And what do you do when that happens? I tell them, I don't think this is going to work. You're direct with them. There, there are a couple of um, clear deal breakers. I wrote a piece for the networker called Rowing to Nowhere about when to break up and what, what some of the deal breakers are. In relational life therapy, we talk about three preconditions for doing the couple's work. Uh, these are things you have to deal with before you can pretend to move the couple closer together. You can meet with the couple, but the focus are one of these conditions. And they are untreated psychiatric disorders. Somebody's got a serious depression or OCD or an anxiety. That has to be dealt with. Uh, serious self-medication issues, including addiction. And acting out issues, uh, either uh, aggressive or uh, sexual. I won't see a couple if there's a third leg of a triangle. 
These have to be addressed first. If partner A is empowered to stand up to these issues and partner B and partner B wants none of it, that could be a deal breaker. You know, if I'm going to be an addict and I don't give a shit what you think, then goodbye. Um, Another deal breaker, which is kind of interesting, is if partner A never really loved partner B to begin with, you know, they married for to have a children or f- to please their mother because it looked good on paper. In that case, I say, why don't you let them go and find somebody who really loves them? You're not doing them a favor. And um, the other one, which is a little more nuanced, but which I find to be true, is if one partner is uh, ex- substantially more mature than the other, more developmentally uh, evolved, Uh, So you have one very healthy one and one rather sick one. If the healthy one wants out, I'll help them get out. Those are the basic deal breakers. Can we talk about sex and how patriarchy shows itself in the bedroom? You know, one of the things I say uh, is that people tend to do in the bedroom what they do in every other room. And uh, people will, uh, by and large, there are exceptions Uh, people will, by and large, replicate the dynamic of the relationship sexually. Now, that's not the same as saying, as many therapists say, that if you clear up the relational dynamic, that sex will flow uh, of its own. People often need help. And it's like grandiosity. You can deal with shame, but you have to deal with the grandiosity per se. You can deal with the relational difficulties, but you may have to deal with the sexual issues per se. There are lots of ways that patriarchy shows up in the bedroom. One of the ways is that women avoid the bedroom altogether. And one of the things I say, I talk about what I call fierce intimacy, which is empowering both partners to tell the truth to each other, to take each other on, to deal with each other. And when one partner doesn't do that, when they move from being forthright to being managerial, resentment builds generosity dries up and passion dries up. Uh, I want to say uh, one of the greatest aphrodisiacs in a couple is telling the truth. And when you don't tell the truth, which is the norm for heterosexual couples, you do not tell the truth, uh, then passion dries up. So that's it's a real sex killer, patriarchy. And then there are lots of interesting sort of uh, power. Well, one of the things is that just because a couple likes to play with one-up, one-down dynamics, which I think is uh, an essential part for many people sexually, um, good sex is not politically correct. And uh, you can be uh, surrendering or you can be dominating in the bedroom and then walk out, but it's consensual. It's play within a framework that is consensual. There's a lot of difference, and this is really critical. As I talk about women and the um, wish to be relieved of sex as caretaking and move into sex as surrender, it's important to understand the difference between, uh, for example, uh, a kind of being ravished fantasy and uh, being raped by somebody. There's a difference between play and reality. Uh, I think that's really critical. But sex has a stubborn way of not being politically correct. I love what Esther says about this. Uh, She says, sex, uh, we want between the sheets what we protest in the streets. (laughs) (laughs) That's true, that's true. Yeah, and I think you're right. I mean, we've talked about how there are many women who have rape fantasies, but that sure. does not mean that they that they want to be raped in real life or, you know, that they want to be dominated in the bedroom, but they want more of an equal partnership uh, outside of the bedroom. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I think uh, I'm with um, the uh, Canadian sexologist Jacques Morin with this one. Um, for a lot of women, sex becomes caretaking. Uh, because they do in the bedroom what they do in every other room, and they're caretakers to men. And caretaking becomes uh, a problem. Um, Becomes work. It becomes more work. And how many women say, ah, sex, it's more work, it's another chore. And the work of anybody working with women in sex is uh, to rediscover their own pleasure 
you know, get a vibrator, roll a joint, go be by yourself. I, I, I love, I, I, you know, Esther's taught me a lot about sex and patriarchy and sex and women. I love what she says. She, she says, it isn't that I don't want sex. I don't want sex with you. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. When you move women out of that caretaking role into uh, their own pleasure, uh, that is this sort of uh, movement in working with sex and women under the patriarchal rule. And one of the ways that women can move into their own pleasure is to be relieved of the responsibility of asserting it. So, gee, I don't know, I'm just here, you're doing it to me, so I guess I can have some pleasure. I'm not really asking for it. You know, there's a lot of ink that's been spilled about the loss of voice, in re- women's loss of voice in relationships, and they do. Women feel that standing up for their own pleasure, for example, or anything else, is selfish. Men also have a loss of voice in relationships that's rarely noted. Women feel that standing up for their wants and needs is selfish. Men feel that they're not supposed to have any wants and needs to begin with. What do you think they're both afraid of? Vulnerability. The essence of traditional masculinity is invulnerability. The more vulnerable you are, the more girly you are, the more of a sissy you are, the more invulnerable you are, the more manly you are. And this is a really good example of what I mean when I say that leading men and women into intimacy requires going beyond patriarchy because you cannot be intimate and invulnerable at the same time. It simply doesn't work. And how do you help men get more in touch with their vulnerable parts? Well, I have this two-year training program. (laughs) It takes a while. <laughs> <laughs> it takes a while to learn how to do it. But the, the method, because uh, I know you know my work, the method I call joining through the truth, where you lovingly confront the man about the difficult ways that he's getting in his own way. You move him out of grandiosity into remorse and open-heartedness uh, in a way that leaves him feeling that you're on his side. And uh, it really, this would be another hour to talk about how you do this. But in essence, you form a relationship with the adult part of the man, the function, the decent part of the man. And it's you and me dealing with this adaptive child part, this grandiose part. Uh, I can't tell you how many times I end a first interview by saying to a guy, you know, Bill, you're a decent man. I've been with indecent men. We call them sociopaths. But you're warm. You're connected. You're a decent man. But you, Bill, who have been a chronic philanderer and liar and cheater for 20 years, what's so sad is I am dealing with a decent man who's behaved indecently for the last 20 years. Will you let me rescue the decent you that's at the core of this from all this nonsense? And you form a coalition with the best part of the man against the worst part of the man. There's one of my favorite sayings, and I think it really is essential, RLT, is from the German poet Goethe, which I paraphrase, or mangle. Uh, and the, the quote is, if you treat a man as he ought to be, he may become who he ought to be. And so I look deep into the heart of the best part of you, and it's you and me. You know, healthy self-esteem is being able to hold yourself in warm regard while clearly facing and feeling appropriately bad about your bad behavior or character flaws or what's flawed in you. It's both. If you don't feel bad about the bad stuff, you're shameless and grandiose. If you feel like you do an ad hominem attack and you're just a rotten person, that's shame and that's no favor to anybody. But remorse or guilt is feeling bad about the behavior and still holding yourself in warm regard as a person. Joining through the truth is self-esteem and therapeutic action. I'm holding the man in warm regard. At the same time, I'm confronting the difficult behavior. And it's the conjunction of these two, truth and love, that produces real spiritual intimacy that's healing between me and the guy. How did you get into male grandiosity? No. I I like to say I started uh, my family therapy career about four years old. I um, I became a therapist in order to garner the skills I would need to have a true conversation with my father, who was a depressed, grandiose, violent man. 
And I needed to have a conversation with him to free myself of the legacy. He was the son of a depressed, violent man. And my children do not say that. And what stands between them and the legacy is me. And I knew that. I knew I had to transform myself or I was doomed. And, um, you know, there's a saying, therapists are people who need to be in therapy 40 hours a week. I, I had to learn the skill of therapy in order to figure out my dad and free myself of that legacy. Because I was depressed and I was angry for much of my early life. Uh, I knew it was off and I knew I had to do something about it. Was there a moment where things shifted for you, where you came to that realization, or was it, was it something that happened over time? It happened over time. Um, it, was a, I had, it was a wayward path. At first I went into comparative literature. I, got a, I was in a five-year PhD program, and I completed most of it. Uh, I came to Boston, drove a cab, was writing the great American novel, and getting shot at. It was back in the 70s, and uh, everybody was doing human potential movement stuff. I got tired of driving a cab and being shot at, so I got a job in a loony bin as a mental health worker. And I remember telling my friends, I sat down in a chair and did a role-play job counseling a role-play therapist, and I said, I knew more about how to do that in 60 seconds than I knew how to do literature in 30 years. And uh, I just knew it was my calling. What advice do you have for women who may be in relationships with narcissistic or grandiose men and are feeling helpless and needing some, some help with their relationship? Well, first... Get the book. Yeah, get the book. Right? <laughs> get all three of them. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> Leave it by the bedside. I'd like to say, um, I don't want to talk about it, which is the book about men. The other two books are about couples. Uh, I don't want to talk about it. It appears under pillows all over America. You know, read this if you want to get any action tonight. Um, women need to find their voice. Bullies need to be stood up to. And if it escalates things, uh, it escalates things. If uh, you can't do it on your own, then drag the guy to a couples therapist. And then I have to say, drag your guy to a couples therapist is really going to help you. Because under the rubric of neutrality, see, I run around the country saying there are design flaws in couples therapy, and neutrality is one of the great design flaws. Women drag men into couples therapists so that we can help them be more relational. And routinely, couples therapists throw women under the bus by saying, you know, well, you have your issues. He yells, screams, you know, throws things and cheats on you. And you have your issues. She's late by 10 minutes a day. You know, it's like, well, you both have issues. Isn't that great? It's not always even Stephen. Right. One's, you know, tipping the scale. Yeah, yeah, right. Exactly. So we take sides. And typically, because women are the voice of I intimacy and dissatis dissatisfaction with low intimacy in the relationship, we side with women, even grandiose women. The way they're asking for intimacy or complaining about not getting it or having a fit or controlling or all that, all of that needs to be cleaned up. But the demand for increased intimacy is a good thing. The response to women's empowerment across the board has been conservative. If women would just go along and make peace, all would be well. Look, that genie is not going back in the bottle. So in RLT, we don't want women to stand down. We want men to stand up and meet these new demands. And I say to men, um, you can do this. It's good for you. It's good for your kids. It's good for your soul. It's good for your body. You can learn how to do this. It's not that hard. Let me teach you. And if you're very direct with men like that and you have leverage and you're holding them in warm regard in your heart and you're letting them know that you're competent and you can do the job, they'll come along. Men aren't. Most men are um, good-hearted and bewildered right now. <laughs> they would do it if they just knew what you women want from them. And uh, so I say empower the woman to stand up for her wants and her needs in the relationship. Stop being managerial and tell the truth. If that doesn't work, 
get some couples therapy and get a couples therapist who will really support you and not throw you under the bus. And what message would you give to grandiose men? I like to say I I want the um, weak to stand up. I want the mighty to melt. The cost of patriarchy in manhood is your heart. And being in the one-up position is no more intimate and ultimately no more satisfying uh, than being in the one-down position. You are missing out, is what I say to these guys. You know, there's um, I tell these narcissistic men the story of Midas. Do you know the real story? Few people do. So Midas was a greedy king, sort of a hoarder, uh, a kind of an addict. And uh, he pissed off Dionysus, who's not a god you piss off. Dionysus is a cruel god. And Dionysus gave him the curse of turning everything into gold. And Midas thinks this is the coolest thing since sliced bread. And he's wandering around, he's turning this to gold, he's turning that to gold. He's getting richer and richer every time he touches something. The story goes by Ovid, until he tries to eat a grape. And he realizes in a moment that he's going to die. Then the story goes, the most precious thing in the world comes skipping into his room, his 11-year-old daughter. And she goes, Daddy. And he goes, No. And she lands in his arms. I know, it's touching, isn't it? And he goes down to the sea with his daughter, now frozen in his arms, and begs Dionysus to relieve him of the curse. And sometimes, in some stories, he does, and in some stories, he doesn't. And what I tell men is, yes, you can have your grandiosity. It will cost you uh, nourishment, and it will cost you connection. So you can be Midas if you want to. Yeah. You make the decision. Right. It's up to you. And know that there are many consequences. Yes, grandiosity impedes your uh, judgment about negative consequences. Think about adolescent boys who drive down the road at 90 miles an hour. Think about the guy in the elevator. Grandiosity impedes your empathy, and it impedes your uh, judgment about negative consequences. So what we do in RLT, and this is part of leverage, is we hold the mirror of those negative consequences up to you very, very forcefully. Yes, you can do what we, we're totally detached from outcome. It's your decision, not ours. But this is what's going to happen to you if you keep going the way you're going. Can, can I tell you, I love to tell stories. Can I tell you my favorite rendition of relational life therapy is, is uh, <clears throat> Dickens' A Christmas Carol. You get a guy who's anti, grand, grandiose and anti-relational to the max, Scrooge. You know, bah humbug, he's horrible. He goes to sleep and he's visited by three ghosts. And I think I do them out of order, but the first ghost is Christmas future. He's at his funeral and everybody's happy he's dead. That's the negative consequence. The second ghost is Christmas past. You go back to his miserable childhood and you deal with the uh, deal with the inner child and the trauma. And then the third ghost is the ghost of Christmas present. He goes to Bob Cratchit's house and he sees what normal looks like. In RLT, there are three movements. The first is loving confrontation. That's where you see what the negative consequences are. The second is family of origin, inner child work. That's where you go back to where this ad- adaption came from. And then the third is education and teaching. That's where you learn what healthy, normal looks like. So that's the rhythm of RLT. Mm. Well, thank you so much for speaking with us today. Oh, this it's was been very a real illuminating. Joy. Thank you. Yeah. It's, it's been a important. pleasure. Hope you enjoyed the podcast and thanks for listening. We also want to thank Point in Passing for their original music and website design. Be sure to subscribe to Lovelink on iTunes and leave us a review. Stay tuned for upcoming podcasts with Esther Perel and Bill Doherty. And check out our upcoming summer workshops for singles and couples on lovelink.co. See you next time.